anoint myself with the blood of Ulrich, that I shall not fear to bleed. I pledge myself to Ulrich's work, that I shall not fear to suffer. I give myself to Ulrich, that I shall not fear to die. The majority of the tribes of the Reich Basin had agreed to be loyal to Sigmar and join his pan-human empire. But the Teutogens, the Burgundians, and the Thurgian tribes needed to be brought under his control by force. First, Sigmar marched to the Teutogen lands, the lands of King Artur, who had been a thorn in his side for so long. The Teutogens had refused to unite with the other tribes to fight off the Norsei, hoping to lie in wait for the Norsei to kill the armies of the northern tribes so that they could sweep in and take their lands. Also, while Sigmar's father, Bajorn, was north fighting the Norsei in a war that he died in, and that the Teutogens had refused to help with, the Teutogens had raided Unbarogan lands and slaughtered villages of Unbarogan citizens. It's also reasonable to assume that Sigmar may have thought about the fact that if the Teutogens had united with his father, Perhaps his father would not have died. The battles would have played out completely differently with this huge tribe adding their warriors. All this would have been running through his mind as he travelled into the Teutogen lands with a great army. Sigmar marched his host into the Teutogen lands and with it, he surrounded the Falschlag, the great fortress capital. He called upon Arta to account for the slaughter of Ubersreich. Down from the great spire, instead of Artur, rode Maestra, the warrior eternal of Ulrichsburg and the second of the Teutogen kings. It sat ill with Maestra that his king did not come forth himself to cast out the Unbarogans, and Sigmar ever a capable judge of men sensed this. Mysra declared that any army that dared assault the fastness of the Teutogens would shatter upon its towering walls. Sigmar in turn declared that if Arta failed to descend from his rock in a single day and explain himself, that he would scale the stone walls of the fist strike and break open his skull in full view of his people. Predictably, no reply came from the King of the Teutogens, and so Sigmar decided to make good on his promise, which I'm sure a lot of people assumed was an exaggeration or a figure of speak. Casting off his armour, he and his trusted bodyguard, Elfgear, scaled the impossible height of the Falschlag and made their way into the city of the Teutogens. Arriving at the centre of the city, a great ring of towering menhirs around a massive plume of silver fire, pure as snow blazing from the ground, the flame of Ulrich. There knelt the mighty Artur, offering prayers to the wolf god of winter. There, before Ulrich's fire, Sigmar called Artur to account for his slaughter of the Umbarogan villages while his father defended the north from the Norsei. Artur callously rebuffed the Unbarogans' aspersions, and insulted the young king, claiming he would have done the same had their positions been reversed. Angered, Sigmar challenged Artur to single combat before Ulrich's flame, and in the sight of the wolf priests, his servants on earth. Before such witnesses, no man could refuse an honourable call to battle and expect to retain favour with the war god. Artur was a seasoned warrior, and knew this fact well. He drew his mighty weapon, the dragon sword of Caledfulch. A magical blade, coated with hoarfrost, said to have been forged from frozen lightning by a shaman of ancient lore from a land across the seas. Possibly Albion. The two kings fought each other, evenly matched until Arta managed to force Sigmar into the flame of Ulrich. 
It is said that Sigmar brushed with the power of his god in that flame, and that Ulric judged his life's worth and protected him from the searing flames, filling him with the might of winter. When Sigmar emerged, he felt furious power fill him. The head of his hammer was wreathed in cold fire, and ghostly tendrils of mist clung to him as if he emerged from the coldest glacier. When he roared, it was the howl of a wolf that broke from his throat, not the bellow of a mortal man. Awed by this, Artur was momentarily stunned and confused and could not defend himself from Sigmar's furious attack, and his blade was shattered by the single strike of Galmaraz. Sigmar's next blow smashed Artur's skull into bloody shards. With that victory, Sigmar became the king of the Teutogens by right of conquest. Next, Sigmar sought to bind the dreaded Thuringians to his banner. The berserkers of the Thuringians were a proud, warlike people, fiercely independent and unwilling to bend their knee to any king who had not earned their obedience through combat. Though Sigmar had exhausted every diplomatic avenue open to him, the Thuringians remained obstinate and bent on bringing the Empire to battle. Though all knew that the battle was merely a formality, as King Otwin could not maintain power over such a warlike race without fighting for independence to the last, it still sat ill with Sigmar that the blood of his people was to be spilled. Still, the Imperial armies were marshalled, and they faced the Thuringians in their homeland of the Drakwald Forest, their howling audible even at the very threshold of their lands. At these sounds, the Emperor's warriors made the sign of the horns, for such was the terror inspired by the roars of these berserkers. Though they fought with the savage bravery eclipsed only by the Norsi, the outcome of the battle was never in doubt. The Thuringian berserkers were outmatched two to one by Sigmar's armies, and the Emperor had never tasted defeat. In the battle, Sigmar faced the fearsome Ulfdar, who would later become a famed heroine in the Battle of Blackfire Pass, and defeated her. Most importantly, he clashed with King Otwin as their respective retinues came blade to blade with each other in the battlefield. The Berserker King was the first to issue the challenge, bellowing a cry of blood and honour, daring Sigmar to fight him. In full view of his warriors, Sigmar raised Galmaraz in acceptance of the challenge. The two kings faced each other in a clash of fire and steel, the mighty axe of the Thuringian kings matched against the ancient warhammer of the mountain folk. Sigmar drove Otwin to his knees, and with his two hands choked the berserk fury from him until he became lucid. With his hands still about Otwin's throat, Sigmar offered the Thuringian a choice. Otwin could offer up his sword oath and join Sigmar's company of warriors, and together they could forge the empire that would hold back darkness from humankind. Or, Sigmar would make a charnel house of the Drakwald for the Thuringian people, killing them all. King Otwin laughed at this genocidal proposal, his honour satisfied by the battle, and then accepted Sigmar's offer of brotherhood, and remarked that the Umbarogan was a man with whom to walk the road into Ulrich's halls. With that, King Otwin and his fearsome people pledged allegiance to the Empire.
To the southeast of the Umbarogan lands lay the territories of the Burgundians in what is now Avaland. The Burgundians at the time remained aloof from the affairs of the Umbarogans, but boasted great trade with their neighbours. In time they grew affluent, and Sigmar's advisers warned that his burgeoning power may be in time a great threat to his own lands. As the Burgundian economy continued to swell, and no treaty kept the two tribes at accord. He called his advisers and friends to his side. Eoforth, Alfgir, Wolfgart and Pendrag were asked for their wisdom. Some spoke of taking a great army to defeat the Burgundians, while others spoke of trying to assassinate King Sigurd and his sons in one fell swoop, wiping out the chain of succession and hopefully erasing the chance of a war happening smoothly bringing this land under their dominion. Sigmar knew, however, that the Brigandians could not be brought into the Empire through such violence or coercion, and nor did he wish as such, for he did not wish to be known as a tyrant, for he knew that the work of tyrants were often destroyed by the very people that they subjugated. Quite an avid reader of history he must have been. Instead, Sigmar said he would ride to Sigurdheim himself and forge a treaty with the folk there. Through forests and rolling plains he travelled to the prosperous lands of the Burgundians, bordering the threatening eastern peaks that were the dominion of orcs, and his admiration for the hardy Burgundians grew with every moment that he spent in their lands. The great city of the Burgundians rested proudly on a rocky hill, surrounded by a stout stone wall. He entered the great hall of King Sigurd, a far cry from the fire-lit austerity of his own hall in Breikdorf. King Sigmar was received politely, yet guardedly, and was asked to state his business. Sigmar spoke of the need for unity, of how the wolves gathered strength while the tribes fought and died over meaningless animosities of how the common ancestry of men was to bind them together in brotherhood, and of how all the men of honour were bound to aid their neighbours without reserve when threatened. This, he said, was the foundation of the empire that he strove for. King Sigurd was an intelligent and wily man, who used words to weave a net around lesser minds. Hearing Sigmar's lofty ideals that he had pitched to him, he decided to test the king's commitment to the brotherhood that he spoke of, and charged Sigmar to deliver his people from an ancient evil. A dragon ogre, a beast of elder days that had destroyed entire cities of the Burgundian territories unimpeded, for no force the southeastern tribe could bring to bear could defeat it. These beasts are amongst the most ancient of the world's living creatures, their incredible longevity, as with almost all things supernatural, can be traced back to the work of the Chaos Gods. Eons ago, the elders of the race made a pact with these ruinous powers, embracing damnation in order to save themselves from a slow decline into extinction. They were given eternal life, and in return, the entire Dragon Ogre race put themselves at the command of the Dark Gods. The Dragon Ogres can only look forward to a time when their eternal bondage will end with the destruction of the world by chaos. Amid the lightning and thunder of the apocalypse, they believe their entire race will wake once again. Until then, these creatures bring death to the enemies of chaos in preparation for the end times hewing bodies with every sweep of their blades and swipe of their monstrous claws. An ancient city of Kralheim had already been left smashed and burning by the beast. Sigmar took it upon himself to kill the dragon ogre and scaled the daunting mountains where it made its dwelling, bringing it to battle. The creature was a thing of flesh and blood, yet it was mightier and older than even the ancient mountains that it claimed as its abode. In an epic battle, where hammer and axe clashed and rent apart the stone of the peaks, Sigmar found purchase upon his enemy's skull, 
and smote Skaranarak with a single strike of Galmaraz, destroying the beast once and for all, and proving his strength before Ulrich. Though victorious, Sigmar's heart wept for the death of so mighty an adversary. In its honour, Sigmar skinned the beast and fashioned a magnificent cloak from its hide, able to turn aside a blade as well as any armour of iron. Sigmar returned to Sigurdheim with the skull of the dragon ogre as proof of his mighty deed. King Sigurd was moved by this, as he was when Sigmar pledged to deliver the Burgundians without reservation. The Burgundian king had thought that Sigmar had sought merely to enslave the men of the Reich with high ideals, but realised his error when he beheld Sigmar's selflessness. He confessed his duplicity to Sigmar, and spoke of how tortured he was by the base deception he had played out. Sigmar easily forgave Sigurd, then and there, as the Burgundian pledged himself without rancour to the greater king, offering Sigmar his sword oaths, and those of the Merogians and Menegoths whose kings owed fealty to the Burgundians. In one fell swoop, all of the southern tribes had now joined the empire. 